So um, I, I'd like to say hello from Atlanta to everyone out there and thanks for jumping on this morning. Um, this is my second time on this series and it is um, an absolute pleasure to be invited and to participate. And I think this is a great resource for our residents and our otolaryngology colleagues. Um, and so thank you to all of our University of Kentucky um, colleagues out there. So with that, I'm gonna jump into my topic today, which is gonna be a little bit of um, an examination of some of the evidence in allergic rhinitis, mostly um, evidence for some of our treatments that we use. And then I'll spend a little bit of the um, last part of the, the talk um, discussing some of the newer endoscopic and radiologic findings that we have associated with um, allergy and allergic rhinitis in the nasal cavity. These are my disclosures. Um, and so as I said, um, we're gonna start with looking at evidence, um, mostly from the international consensus statement on allergy and rhinology for allergic rhinitis, which was an effort that I was lucky to lead um, a couple years back. And then uh, radiologic and endoscopic find findings of sinonasal allergy. So for anyone that uh, is not familiar with the ICAR allergic rhinitis statement, uh, it was published in 2018 um, and like I said, I was very uh, lucky and uh, had the pleasure of leading a, an incredible group of, of national and international authors in this effort. It was published in the um, International Forum of Allergy and Rhinology. And you can see uh, at the bottom here, we have the link to um, the free download of the full article. So this took us about 18 months to prepare. It's almost 250 pages. And um, by virtue of being such an, uh, a lengthy and intense document, it's really designed to be a reference document. And I'll talk about some of the features that you can use um, to help navigate through that. We had 107 authors from lots of different specialties, um, largely otolaryngology, although we did have allergy and immunology pediatrics, pulmonary um, rhinologists, some nurses, environmental health, etc. And basically we took allergic rhinitis and broke it down into eight broad content areas and 103 different topics that related to allergic rhinitis, um, which sounds like a daunting number. I, did, I uh, honestly didn't know when I was starting this that there could be so many different things that we could examine about allergic rhinitis but it was fun to learn along the way. Uh, the PDF that you're able to download actually has electronic links to each topic um, directly from the table of contents. So this actually helps uh, for people to be able to search individual topics and navigate right to them. And each of these sections is relatively short when you read it. So uh, the document is not really intended to be read from cover to cover. It's, it's really meant to be used as a reference when you're searching for an individual topic and the uh, evidence related to that. There's also a summary document that is a much easier read. Um, it kind of summarizes all of the main evidence levels and recommendations for lots of the topics in this document. And that's also available through a, a free download. So these are the eight broad content areas that we examined. Um, everything from 
meant to be a resource um, for the practitioner, the researcher, to look at evidence-based recommendations. And those recommendations are based on benefit, harm, and cost. And it's also an evaluation of the knowledge gaps and areas for future research. And that was an important feature of the document so that we can understand what we know and uh, potentially what we don't know. So the ICAR documents are based on the evidence-based review with recommendations methodology developed by Luke Rudnick and Tim Smith. And that basically consists of a thorough examination of the literature in any one particular area with a concentration on mostly high level evidence. So systematic reviews, meta-analyses, randomized control trials, and then supplementing that with other uh, lower level evidence such as cohort studies, case series, and um, expert opinion. Once all of the uh, evidence is gathered, a literature table is put together, and I'll show you an example of those. And that can be really helpful to quickly summarize each study and understand um, what the, the study was examining, the groups, and the, what the ultimate outcome of the study was. And then once all of the evidence is put together, an aggregate grade of evidence is obtained um, by sort of summarizing the, to the uh, levels of evidence of each individual study. And from that, a recommendation is developed. Once that is all written by an initial author, um, then two or three uh, additional authors review it online through an iterative review process, and there's a final consensus amongst all the authors. So this is an example of a summary, an evidence summary table. And you can see that um, in a very quick view, you can identify the study, the year it was published, the design, level of evidence, um, and the groups, what they were exa uh, actually examining, and their endpoints and conclusions. And so um, each paper is summarized in really just a single line so that you can um, assess what each study was, was looking at. Once all of the studies are placed into a table um, and each level of evidence for each study is graded, then the aggregate grade of evidence is put together. And you can see that um, if there are, if, the, if there's a very high level of uh, conglomerate evidence, then that would be a, a grade A and then further down uh, to grade D. Once the aggregate grade of evidence is determined, then things like um, benefit of that intervention, harm, cost, um, and other considerations are taken into account and a recommendation is developed. And that recommendation can be anything from strong recommendation for the treatment to um, option in the middle and then strong recommendation against the treatment on the other end. Sometimes there's really no, um, not enough evidence to make a recommendation, and so occasionally we end up with no recommendation. And this is what the literature summary table shows. It has these elements, which summarizes the grade of evidence based on what the individual studies are and kind of how that all fits together. And explanation of, as I said, benefit, harm, cost, um, and then a benefit harm assessment, which is kind of where that balance lies. Um, ultimately, the policy level, which is the actual recommendation for or against the treatment is um, stated. So as I mentioned before, there are, um, there are evidence-based reviews with recommendations that exist and the ICAR documents really just uh, a big conglomeration of evidence-based reviews with recommendations on different individual topics. These are some of the examples of EBRRs that are out there, and this is a commonly accepted method of reviewing literature that's frequently published in the IFAR journal. The initial ICAR for rhinosinusitis came out in 2016 and was led by Richard Orlandi. It's currently undergoing an update now with anticipated publication of the update in 2021. And then, as I said, our um, allergic rhinitis document was published in 2018. It will probably be updated um, 
in about five to six years from original publication. So um, I've talked a little bit about recommendations and I think it's important to take a step back and say that um, recommendations are just that. Um, it, they're not the standard of care. They're not absolutely, they're not absolute necessity. It's just taking the um, conglomeration and the strength of the evidence to kind of form the foundation um, of what of kind of evidence-based treatment. We still have to evaluate patients individually and decide what's best for each individual patient as their provider. So what did we learn from the ICAR process? Um, we learned what we know about allergic rhinitis. We learned what we don't know. And we, um, I think, as I mentioned before, one of the most important things that we learned is what are the knowledge gaps and areas that we can research in the future. So I'm just going to go through a couple of um, sort of things that you may be fairly familiar with and then maybe some um, new and interesting things that you might uh, find yourself looking at in the future. So starting with some of the more common things, um, antihistamines. I think for allergic rhinitis, we're pretty familiar with treatment with antihistamines, both oral and intranasal. And the evidence that we have really supports that. So uh, for oral antihistamines, there are 21 meta-analyses of randomized control trials, and, and that's um, extremely high-level evidence. They are generally low cost, and for the second-generation non-sedating antihistamines, the benefits appear to outweigh harm. Um, certainly, the first-generation or initial antihistamines that were out on the market, some of them are still are, but they can be significantly sedating and um, cross the blood-brain barrier um, to a fairly good, uh, significant degree. So generally for the, the non-sedating antihistamines, the benefits outweigh uh, the harm. And there is a strong recommendation for the use for allergic rhinitis. Intranasal antihistamines have had several randomized control trials. Um, they're generally low to moderate costs. They do uh, require prescription in the um, US, um, it, but there is a preponderance of benefit and they're particularly helpful for sneezing, itching, rhinorrhea, and um, can have some benefits for ocular symptoms. They're, they do not tend to be quite as helpful for nasal congestion. Um, and so these uh, intranasal antihistamines are generally recommended. The intranasal corticosteroids are another mainstay of treatment for allergic rhinitis. Um, and there have been extensive randomized control trials um, as well as meta-analyses of um, intranasal corticosteroids. Um, there are several of these that are available over the counter. I think we're all familiar with, um, with the vast majority of these. They're generally low cost and the benefits seem to outweigh harm uh, for treating both seasonal and perennial allergic rhinitis. And they are strongly recommended for the treatment of allergic rhinitis. Other therapies which have level A evidence, um, nasal saline is very helpful for allergic rhinitis. The intranasal corticosteroid, intranasal antihistamine combination therapies and both subcutaneous and sublingual immunotherapy. There's um, very all of these treatments that they can be very beneficial for allergic rhinitis. What about some of the weaker um, levels of evidence? So we've talked about pharmacotherapy. I mentioned allergen immunotherapy, both um, subcutaneous and sublingual. Um, what are a little bit weaker. There's usually this sort of triad of um, allergic rhinitis treatments that we think of initially, and environmental controls tend to be in there. So um, let's talk a little bit about that because the evidence is a bit weaker for those. So there are a fair number of studies that look at um, allergen avoidance and environmental control measures for allergic rhinitis. And um, we evaluated how dust mite, cockroach, pets, and then pollen and, and occupational studies. And this, um, most of the uh, studies, the vast majority of studies have been done for um, house dust mite. 
uh, including one meta-analysis. Um, I, I would say that overall, the evidence compared to pharmacotherapy and allergen immunotherapy treatments, the evidence is weaker for environmental controls and allergen avoidance. Um, and a lot of this potentially is due to the way that these studies are designed. A lot of times when the studies are done to evaluate um, environmental controls, they tend to look a lot at the levels of allergen in the environment. So there's, um, they look at the, the level of allergen prior to the intervention, the intervention is performed, and then the level of allergen is assessed afterwards. Um, and unfortunately, in a lot of these studies, there's um, not a lot of evaluation of respiratory um, symptoms. So um, that's really what our patients are interested in and what we're interested in is, are they symptomatically better controlled on these therapies? And I think that that's where we could um, do better in some of this evidence. Um, so there's, in general, the evidence says that um, there's a possible reduction in nasal symptoms and potentially secondary prevention of asthma. Um, the costs of a lot of these therapies can range from very low to very high. Uh, it's also been found that, that um, doing combinations of different therapies tends to have more benefit. So um, in other words, for house dust mite, um, using a kerosene therapy as well as um, filtration, um, regular cleaning, et cetera. So um, in order to have maximum benefit, it appears that you have to do um, several different interventions, which can potentially be more costly. Um, so while patients are oftentimes interested in these therapies and they can be an adjunct to some of the other things that we're doing, the um, true benefit of um, reduction in sinonasal and respiratory symptoms has not been really extensively studied. What about some of the newer, more exciting things that we might see um, out there in the future for allergic rhinitis? Some of the things that have been kind of under early study and, and uh, that may need a little bit more evaluation, but we might see uh, a bit more later on. Uh, intralymphatic immunotherapy. This is an interesting potential therapy. So this is basically um, allergen immunotherapy, antigen injected directly into the lymph nodes. And it's actually, um, the studies are, have uh, typically used the linguinal, uh, inguinal lymph nodes, not the inguinal, have used the inguinal lymph nodes, um, identified under ultrasound, and then had the uh, allergen injected directly in there. And this is usually done in three separate treatments. Um, each treatment separated by four weeks is the typical um, sort of regimen. And, and that's it. So three different injections over about 12 weeks. And um, that actually the dose that's injected is lower than in your typical allergen immunotherapy injection. They tend to have lower risk of adverse events. Um, the reduced number of office visits. It's a little bit of a different um, scenario than coming in for a subcutaneous immunotherapy injection that would usually be um, given kind of in the deltoid area. Um, this is, as I said, a ultrasound guided inguinal lymph node injection. So um, discussing that with patients may, may take a little bit of a different turn, um, but there is some evidence to support it. So there have been um, several randomized controlled trials, relatively small numbers of um, patients so far. Um, but there have been some uh, benefits. So you can see effective and safe, effective and safe, immunological changes were seen. Um, and uh, so where do we go from here? Um, we probably need more study with larger number of subjects. Um, 
We need to evaluate the safety and efficacy compared to subcutaneous and sublingual immunotherapy. I've mentioned some of the potential benefits, perhaps only three injections compared to, um, I believe the average for, subcut for a subcutaneous immunotherapy regimen is um, somewhere around 70 or 80 um, injections over time. Um, and then economic comparisons um, could be helpful for us to um, sort of sort out what might be the most cost effective treatment. Um, also potentially to see the long term benefit of this therapy. We do know that subcutaneous and sublingual immunotherapy uh, tend to have long, uh, long term benefit even after stopping the immunotherapy regimen. So I think there's still some work to be done, but this is potentially promising. What about acupuncture? Um, this is something that, depending on the area of the, the US that you practice in and potentially um, internationally, may be discussed um, a bit more openly in certain areas than others. Um, but this is a type of uh, sort of alternative medicine that many patients can, can potentially be interested in. And actually its effects in allergic rhinitis have been evaluated in randomized control trials and meta-analyses. Um, and this is just a summary of two meta-analyses that have been done. Um, so there have been several randomized control trials and the vast majority of these are fairly well designed. So they're um, actual acupuncture at um, known acupuncture sites on the body versus sham acupuncture. So essentially the insertion of acupuncture needles um, at random sites. And then they uh, have evaluated um, by the traditional endpoints that allergy immunotherapy studies typically use. So symptom scores, quality of life, um, questionnaires with, that are validated, and then the use of rescue medications. The initial um, uh, meta-analysis that was published in 2008, which um, included about uh, seven or eight studies, basically did not show a difference in effect, but then subsequently several more studies were done and a, a subsequent meta-analysis published in 2015 did show reduction in nasal symptoms, improvement of quality of life scores, and uh, reduction in, um, in allergy uh, rescue medications. So um, this is potentially something that uh, could help our, aller our allergic rhinitis patients. Um, and something that I have to say that I was um, not some, it, it was not a therapy that um, was frequently discussed um, in my clinic before, but I am uh, certainly open to discussing it with patients who might have an interest in it. Um, what about probiotics? Uh, so this is certainly something that our um, population is interested in. The US uh, probiotic market was about $3.3 billion in 2015. And so people are definitely using this therapy for lots of different things. In, um, as of our, the publication of this document, there were actually two um, meta-analyses that had been done, which included um, 26 um, randomized control trials as well. Um, so there's really level A evidence. In the end, we determined that this was an option for therapy. Um, even though it was quite high, the difficulty here is that um, there are multiple different probiotic um, types of therapies. And, and even though there are lots of studies of probiotics in general, the specific um, type of therapy, there were uh, fewer studies for each individual one. So um, lots of variation in org organism and dosing. And so it was difficult to provide a specific recommendation on these. So these are just some of kind of the glimpses into some of the evaluations that we had done and looked at um, in this document. And I think it's important for us to, like I said, understand um, what the evidence is for some of our more common treatments 
um, like antihistamines, intranasal corticosteroids, uh, also subcutaneous and sublingual immunotherapy, but then also to be aware of the therapies that may have lower level evidence, even if they tend to be some of the more popular therapies with our patients, and some of the things that might get a little bit more traction in the future, or some things that we might not frequently be talking about in our clinic, um, but might actually have some good evidence behind them. Um, so I would encourage you, if you haven't, I would encourage you to download the document and um, have that for a reference so that you can quickly take a look at it and, and uh, reference it um, when people potentially bring up these types of therapies. So I'm going to switch gears just a bit and um, kind of in the vein of talking about up-to-date uh, allergy evidence and um, potential therapies, I'm going to talk about some of the important endoscopic and radiologic signs that might point us towards allergy. And um, it's interesting, I think, that I'm going to um, switch gears in this, in this way because if you go back to the ICAR document, we actually have sections on endoscopy and radiology and whether or not they can be helpful in identifying allergy. And I will admit that in the document published only uh, in 2018, we essentially said that endoscopy and radiology, um, or you know, obtaining CT scans and regularly performing endoscopy did not have a lot of evidence behind it uh, when evaluating the allergic rhinitis patients. And um, this may be something that we might be changing in the future in an, an updated version of the ICAR allergic rhinitis document. So let's see why, let's see what some of the evidence shows as we get there. So um, traditional signs of allergy. These are things that we learned in medical school, in allergy lectures, et cetera. These are things that we often um, have been taught are associated with allergies. So things like um, red eyes or conjunctival injection, tearing, um, watery eyes, um, allergic shiners, so venous congestion kind of causing these um, black eye looking um, swollen and uh, a little bit of a bluish hue under the eye. Denny's lines, so these thick sort of creases under the eyes. The supratip crease, so this little um, hyperemic area that is essentially from that um, allergic salute um, rubbing the nose in an inferior to superior fashion. Then turbinate hypertrophy and this kind of bluish hue of the turbinates. So that's also thought to be from venous congestion as well. This is something that um, is not kind of in the classic textbooks as being associated with allergy um, and is really just sort of recently described and validated. Um, by several different centers. Um, so originally described um, at our institution, sort of led by my partner, Dr. Uh, Delgadio, the recognition of middle turbinate polyps or polypoid edema. Um, and so you can see here a middle turbinate in this really sort of watery effect, uh, watery polypoid look, or um, even frank polyps of the middle terminate. So this was originally described in a series in 2000 and um, validated by the group in Sydney, Australia, and they actually kind of looked at the degree of polypoid edema and associated that to the actual um, severity of allergy and saw that as the palipoid edema um, got worse, the uh, uh, assessment of allergy that they saw in testing was also worse. In 2017, um, the group in New Orleans at, at Ochsner, led by Ed McCool, has um, basically um, described that this polypoid change of the middle turbinate is really distinct from your typical paranasal sinus polyps that, that sort of originate in the ethmoid region. And so uh, I'm gonna show just a quick example. This is um, a, 
patient in their early 20s who presents with um, an allergic history and complaints of nasal congestion. This is a right nasal cavity, so the septum is here. Um, septum is here. And you can see that this is kind of a large polyp structure, I'm trying to kind of, you see the inferior turbinate there. You can see the middle turbinate underneath and this sort of very bulky polyps actually attached to the middle turbinate directly. It is not coming from the middle meatus or the ethmoid cavity. And when we look at the patient CT scan, we can see in a coronal view from anterior to posterior, the frontal sinuses are generally clear. We've got a little bit of a septal deviation and you can see this opacification of the right nasal cavity. Pretty large concha bullosa, um, but the rest of the sinuses have pretty minimal disease. There is not a lot of sinus opacification or obstruction. Um, and when initially looking at that very large polyp on that right side, um, one would think that inherently the sinuses would probably be opacified and that's not really what we're seeing. It's really just kind of an isolated uh, polyp there on the right middle terminate. So some of the CT findings that can help us um, differentiate or, or point towards um, an allergy contribution are things like involvement of the septum and kind of mid structures of the nasal cavity with this peripheral clearing actually in the sinuses. So this is kind of a very centralized picture. The middle turbinates being oriented in an oblique manner. Um, and that's typically thought to be from the polyposis originating on the middle turbinates and growing larger and kind of pushing the turbinates laterally and that can proceed to sinus obstruction and opacification from a medial to lateral extent. Um, and then in general a relatively low lund mckay score. So even though there's a significant opacification of the nasal cavity and a lot of sort of edema and um, disease within the mid structures of the scan, the rest of the scan oftentimes is pretty clear. So um, you kind of have this little halo effect. And oftentimes these patients will be quite allergic. Um, so um, on our allergy skin testing panel, a six is the highest endpoint that we typically get and you can see we have lots of um, very significant allergy on this um, example here. So what happens at surgery? This was a relatively early um, case of um, this sort of middle turbinate uh, polyposis or central compartment atopic disease and I'll talk a little bit about that here in a minute. That's kind of where we get some um, the central compartment disease a little bit more than just middle turbinate polyps. So you can see a lot of disease here centrally with that peripheral clearing, especially of the lamina papricia and ethmoid roof and the lateral aspects of the maxillary sinus. Um, so relatively little disease in the sphenoid sinus. And we'll kind of quickly come back through just so you can see it again. So lots of central disease, peripheral clearing, essentially no frontal sinus disease. And we're gonna look at, um, surgically, we're gonna look at what that, that looks like. So right side, see that there's um, kind of a lot of polypoid change of that right middle terminant. The septum is here on the right side of the screen. We're going to take a quick look back at the superior turbinate, which really has a nice polypoid change to it. So this is kind of confirming that central edema, a uh, little bit of um, edema of the ethmoid bulla, clear, thick secretions, non purulent So if we sculpt the turbinate, Kind of remove some of that obstruction. This was an early a case that I did very early on kind of opened everything up and you can see that the mucosa of the sinuses is um, quite 
it really looks quite normal. It is not edematous. Um, really all of that edema and um, polypoid disease was in that central compartment. And this is similar on this, on the left side, you can see that the actual septum is polypoid, the middle turbinate is polypoid. On opening it, the sinus mucosa looks very normal. I'm gonna stop here and say that um, I would do, I, I may treat this patient a little bit differently nowadays. Like I said, this was a, a um, case that I did very early on and it, it nicely shows that once you get into the sinuses, the mucosa is very, very um, quiescent. It's not really inflamed. Um, you can see that uh, all along here. This is maxillary sinus, lamin and papricia. Um, you know, we have a bit more work to do in understanding this disease process, but um, it certainly is possible that once we open these sinuses and potentially expose this naive mucosa to additional allergens, that we could, um, that, that the inflam inflammation could be perpetuated. We can keep it at bay typically with um, topical anti-inflammatory treatment, topical steroids, um, allergen immunotherapy, things like that. But um, we do have within our practice examples of where the um, sinus mucosa has become inflamed. And so we really have to think about and plan these surgeries um, very carefully. We wanna reduce that um, inflammation of the mid portion of the um, nasal cavity structures and the turbinates, um, but maybe do a bit more limited sinus surgery and keep the patients on um, topical steroids and encourage um, allergen immunotherapy in these cases. So the pathology on these um, patients, you can see that there's this sort of polypoid change here. So edema, uh, respiratory mucosa, a little bit deeper um, right here where the star is, we can see that um, this is a very eosinophilic process. So TH2 mediated, lots of eosinophils. This is um, pretty typical of what we would think of um, kind of in that allergic cascade, the TH2 mediated uh, side of things. So uh, as I said, once we get beyond the middle turbinate polyps alone uh, and kind of start having this increased opacification and sort of that medial to lateral spreading, um, we've termed this central compartment atopic disease or CCAD. And this is becoming an increasingly recognized uh, entity. It was actually recently added to the EPOS 2020 classifications so um, really very distinct from the um, typical paranasal sinus polyps. And what we have seen is that the primary structures involved are the middle turbinate, superior turbinate, and then that posterior superior nasal septum with the peripheral clearing of um, the sinuses. So um, a lot less disease up here along the ethmoid roof, lamina papricia and lateral aspects of the maxillary sinus, as well as in the frontal and sphenoid sinuses. Now, admittedly, in later stages of the disease, as the opacification continues to expand, sometimes those structures can be involved. Um, and so we have, you know, you certainly can see later stage aspects of the disease. You can also see CCAD in combination with other things, with typical paranasal sinus And so we're really learning uh, quite a bit more about the, the disease in general. But I think it's important that we um, all kind of learn to look for this and identify it in our, pac our patients because really it has a very, very high association with allergy, with not only um, positive testing, but also allergy symptoms. And um, so, you know, instituting, um, identifying the allergy and uh, treating it is, is likely going to be a very helpful um, adjunct to this, to controlling this. Um, and I think that our, 
hopefully our long-term um, outcomes, uh, evaluating how patients do with allergy immunotherapy is gonna be very helpful for us to, us to really understand um, the role of immunotherapy in treating this. So um, I'll kind of summarize there. I think that I've shown in this um, talk that there's strong evidence for a lot of the therapies that we use to treat allergic rhinitis. There are certainly some things that we need to study more. There are some exciting, um, potentially new therapies that may change our practice. Um, I didn't really talk a whole lot about um, some of the nuances of some of the diagnostic modalities, um, some of specific knowledge gaps and things. Those are um, elaborate, elaborated in the document, and, and I think that um, it's fun to kind of read about those, some of the controversies and things we need to study in the future. Um, and then, like I said, at the last part, I just wanted to highlight um, some endoscopic and radiologic findings that can point towards allergies so that you guys can be on the lookout for those. So with that, I'll kind of um, stop and I'll be happy to take any questions for you. Um, I'm sorry about the, the little bump in the middle. I think my internet got cut off, but hopefully you heard uh, most of what I was saying. Does anybody have any questions? Maybe I'll wait just another couple minutes in case anyone wants to ask anything. And um, after that, I'll be happy to turn it over to whoever's next. Thank you very much. Very good talk. Thank you.